and many thanks to the um, organizers. So uh, Enrique, David, Pedro, and Antonio for the invitation to come here and uh, give this talk. Particular thanks to Pedro also for hosting me last week, managed to get funding from the London Mathematical Society. So I could spend um, a week down here and uh, thank you, Pedro, you were an absolute uh, fabulous uh, host. So thanks a lot for uh, that. All right, so um, I have taken the description of this being like a mini course, fairly literal, in the sense that I will try to actually give some proofs. I'll also give quite a lot more background to detail, perhaps, uh, than I normally would in a research talk. So I hope this should also be accessible for a, um, a variety of people, including people who wouldn't even uh, know what uh, a CK space associated with an almost disjoint family really is and what they're good for. So. Basically, uh, to give you a quick overview of what I uh, plan to do, well, today I will start by telling you what almost disjoint families are and uh, what they're good for. Why should we care about them as uh, Barnard space or Barnard lattice uh, theorists? And then, having said that, I want to give you some background um, of CK spaces. And in particular, I want to highlight some recent applications of uh, CK spaces associated with um, almost disjoint families uh, to kind of motivate why I thought this was a timely uh, talk to give here. And um, next thing I want to try and explain what my background, where I come from, I wouldn't really claim that I'm a um, Barnard space theorist and certainly even less a Barnard lattice uh, theorist. I'm much more like uh, coming from an operator theory uh, background. And so I want to tell you something about Barnard spaces with few operators. And in order to connect that to my main topic, I want to uh, zoom in on CK spaces with few operators, uh, in particular, what that even uh, means, all right? Then I want to uh, give you some fundamental uh, facts about what I call the Mrovka space. So this is this um, um, locally compact uh, topological space that is associated with an almost disjoint family. And um, finally, I will give you some consequences today of the main theorem I'll give you about a CFK space with few operators. So I shall talk about self-maps, decompositions, um, operator ideals, uh, characters. Okay, and that I think will take me to the end of um, this hour and a half. Then tomorrow, just a brief uh, view ahead of time, I will try and outline the um, uh, proof of the main theorem. Um, that's the <clears throat> part that is uh, joint work with Kashmida, where some of the other parts are as well. And then I want to sort of uh, uh, link this with the um, topic of automatic uh, continuity of the uh, homomorphisms from well, what I call B of X. And uh, well, coming from operator theory, it's perhaps not surprising that means the boundary operators on the boundary space X. So thank you, Alejandro, for totally messing that up yesterday. And um, well, then uh, finally, I want to talk about some uh, work that's ongoing with my uh, student, Max Arnott, namely to try and look at um, various Barnard spaces X, and for those to decide when all the quotients of that particular B of X module or any of its uh, closed ideals has a unique uh, algebra norm. But that's uh, going to be the topic tomorrow, so um, that should hopefully take me to the end of the uh, three hours. Okay, so back to the start, almost each families. So I write um, square bracket N superscript omega, uh, for the uh, collection of infinite subsets of the set of natural numbers. Not that I think it matters here whether you include zero or not in the set of natural numbers. I usually don't. But as I say, if you prefer it that way, I think that's fine. This is perhaps a slight uh, mix of notation because obviously the omega stands for infinite in sort of ordinal notation, and the n, I guess, is sort of more standard uh, mathematics, but it seems to be uh, widely used. So that's a symbol I will um, use. And then uh, an almost disjoint family. We, we, uh, we understand a collection of infinite subsets of the natural numbers such that whenever you take two distinct sets in the family, their intersection is finite, all right? And well, the key result uh, in this area uh, is, well, I accredited it to Sierpinski from 1928. He actually did it also for higher cardinalities in that paper, and it may well have been known in this particular case at the time, so if anyone knows the history better than me, please let me know uh, in the coffee break. But anyway, Sierpinski showed that you can uh, find uncountable almost disjoint families, all right? Obviously, countable um, disjoint families exist, right? You can split the um, uh, natural numbers into uh, countably many 
uh, infinite sets that are pairwise disjoint. That's not a difficult thing to do, but you can do uncountable uh, ones uh, if you only need um, almost disjointness. And in fact, you can do even better. Uh, you can go both get all the way up to the um, cardinality of the continuum. And this will be a recurrent uh, theme here. I can reveal the difference between uncountable and the cardinality of the continuum. Um, but we'll come back to that. So, as I say, I want to make this like um, accessible, like a mini course. So I thought I would tell you how to do these, how to construct almost uh, disjoint families. If you've never seen them before, uh, you may think this is a somewhat uh, obscure uh, object. It is, but they're actually uh, incredibly easy to uh, construct, assuming that you know how to do it. I think if you don't know how to do it, uh, it's uh, not so easy. And uh, so the first, I'll give you two constructions. In the first one, we uh, replace the set of natural numbers with another uh, countably infinite set, namely the rational numbers. Of course, we can do that. There's nothing special here with the, um, um, with the, for the natural numbers. I mean, the fact that they are nicely ordered and whatever doesn't matter at all right, in the definition. If you want, once you have an almost disjoint family of um, subsets of Q, you just take a bijection with the natural numbers and you get one from the natural numbers. Okay, and the idea now is that uh, here we have extra structure, right? Because we can pick an irrational number, say R, um, and then we can find a sequence of rational numbers that I denote as Q subscript N in the sequence and superscript R for the limit, okay, which converges to my uh, irrational number R. And now, my uh, sets in the almost disjoint family, they will simply be the um, elements of this uh, sequence. This is clearly an infinite set, right? Because I started with an irrational number R, so the uh, sequence must have infinitely many uh, distinct terms. It can't be eventually constant, okay? Uh, so that will be my, um, the sets of my almost disjoint family. So I just need to check they are indeed uh, almost disjoint. I do that contrapositively. So assume that we have two irrational numbers R and S and the intersection of these uh, sequences um, is infinite. Well, of course, that means that I can extract a common subsequence from the two um, sequences here. So the first one here, Q and R, that converges to R, is the second one that converges to S, okay? So if they share an infinite, uh, an infinite subsequence, then of course the two limits must be the same. So uh, uh, as I say, by contraposition, what I've argued is that the, uh, if R and S are distinct, then the intersection of these two uh, sequences is um, finite. And well, that's my almost disjoint family. And of course it has cardinality C because we know that there are continuum many irrational numbers. So that's one way you can get such a, um, a beast. Okay, so the second way, I think I should just uh, draw a picture because it's much, much easier to uh, basically uh, draw it and illustrate it. And it uh, builds on the binary tree or the Cantor cube or whatever you, however you want to um, think of it. So let me just try and draw a binary tree here. Go and continuous. Okay, then we just uh, enumerate the uh, nodes. So we start say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and so on and so forth. And now the way you generate your uh, almost disjoint family is you simply uh, pick a branch in your tree and you then write down the numbers uh, that you see on that branch, okay? That gives you clearly an infinite set because the branches are infinite. You imagine the binary tree continues infinitely, okay? And it's almost disjoint. Well, that's kind of um, geometrically obvious, right? Because if you have two distinct branches, at some point they uh, split. And after that point, they never come back together because it's a tree. So once you have uh, taken separate paths, you never uh, see uh, each other again, right? So that's the, uh, that's the sort of the picture, and um, you can then check everything works. So I think I wrote out on the slide how to do this in, um, say, more uh, formal or symbolic <coughs> mathematics. So uh, in that case, I think we start with the Cantor cube, so the um, uh, sequences of zeros and ones, so functions from the natural numbers into zero, one. Okay, then basically what I've written down there, Mn of f, so f now is my infinite branch, 
what I call um, n of f, they are, that's the nth number along the uh, path here, okay? So if you write them out in binary, this is uh, just binary expansions, like one is just one in binary, two, of course, is one, zero, three is one, one, four is one, zero, zero, five is one, zero, one, six is one, one, zero, and seven is one, 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 and so on and so forth, right? And you will see each time I shift down, uh, one level, I basically put a number um, one in front and I shift. Okay, so that's how we um, how this builds up. Okay, so basically, this is how you see these uh, correspondence with the numbers that what I've written up there is just a binary expansion, or well, or the number, the sort of a, if you like, base 10 expansion of the number that in binary would start with the number one, and then you have these. Um, digits here, zeros and ones afterwards. <clears throat> the reason why I must start with the number one, by the way, is that otherwise, say, if you just had the sequence zero, 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 right, that would just constantly give you um, uh, zero, so then you wouldn't get uh, new elements, you wouldn't get an infinite set of that, right? <clears throat> so you can see, for example, the branch that goes over here, that's the one that uh, corresponds to the constant zero sequence in that picture, all right? And then, as I say, <clears throat> M of F, capital M of F, that's the collection of these numbers along the branch. And well, now what, all, what remains to check is that this family is almost disjoint. And as I said before in the picture, this is simply because uh, when two branches, I mean, two branches will be, can be initially the same, but then eventually they split and then they never come back together. And if you write that out uh, more formally, well, you pick K to be the um, first time that your two um, sequences differ. And then because of the way my enumeration uh, goes, right, that my um, N of F only goes up to N minus one. Well, then turns out in that case, you can check that when N is less than or equal to this number K, then M N of F and M N of G are the same. So that corresponds to say my second branch. Let's see, if my second branch was this one here, right? This would then uh, mean that I am, the two are equal for the first three, but then after that, they never come back together, all right? So therefore, <clears throat> this uh, collection here of these uh, infinite sets, that's, a, um, and, um, that's an almost uh, disjoint family. And of course, the cardinality of this uh, binary tree is the continuum. So I have succeeded in uh, constructing an almost disjoint family of cardinality continuums uh, once again. Okay, so this is just to give you a flavor of um, where these uh, beasts uh, come from, how you can sort of, you can actually get your hands on them. And now the uh, name of the game uh, essentially is to construct, uh, I mean, modify such families to get very uh, weird properties, properties that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Okay, so, let me just give you a few um, um, applications of them. Where do they appear in mathematics? And the truth is they appear in an awful lot of different branches of mathematics. Perhaps the most uh, natural home for them is uh, infinite uh, combinatorics. After all, they are kind of combinatorial um, objects and clearly are very infinite in nature. But also they have uh, strong connections with foundations or set theory, because when you construct uh, almost different families, um, with particular, uh, say, obscure or unexpected properties, you may need extra actions outside uh, standard um, ZFC. Uh, and, I mean, perhaps the most obvious one is the continuum hypothesis, or indeed its negation. We shall see um, several examples of that here in this um, talk. But uh, there are also uh, other examples where people have used um, such additional axioms in order to do constructions. Um, but <clears throat> uh, to perhaps Come closer to uh, our topic, um, almost disjoint families play an important role in topology. That's set point of point set topology, right? Uh, because, I mean, given an almost disjoint uh, family so script A, you can um, associate with it a locally uh, compact Hausdorff space that I denote K sub A. And the idea of that, I think, goes back to Alexandra van Eurason in the 1920s. And essentially what they did was they uh, used our uh, first uh, construction, uh, the one with the um, rational numbers converging to irrational numbers. They uh, used that construction in order to uh, produce a topological space with uh, certain properties. Okay. And um, well, 
uh, if you are a functional analyst, and I guess that's a common theme for most of us here, uh, then uh, this gives us a connection why almost disjoint families also play a role in functional analysis. So if I use the blackboard bold K for my scalar field, which happens most of the time can be either real or complex scalars, um, and you take any uh, locally compact Hausdorff space K, then of course you can look at the um, scalar value continuous functions find on K that vanish at infinity, that gives you a Banach space. Just to remind you to say that they vanish at infinity, it just means that if you take any uh, positive epsilon, then the set of um, points in the uh, set K, for which the absolute value of the function is greater than or equal to epsilon, that's a compact set, all right? Uh, so this is a natural generalization to locally compact Hausdorff spaces from the just compact, uh, the compact situation. Right? Well, it's not only a Banach space, of course, it's a Banach lattice as well. It's even a C star algebra. So uh, almost any branch of um, functional analysis, you can see why uh, this kind of uh, object is of interest to you. And this is a connection that brings it over to, um, I mean, makes it relevant for, for me, uh, connects to this uh, conference in particular. Okay. So, um, let's see. The, um, let me just try and show you how you construct that uh, compact space. So we had here this compact space um, uh, that I call K subscript A. Um, how do we construct that? Well, as a functional analyst, this is how I think the simplest uh, way to get your hands on it is. So you have your almost disjoint family uh, script A. Okay. Then you look at the subspace, the close linear subspace of um, little and infinity that is spanned by the indicator functions of the sets in the almost disjoint family together with the um, finite uh, sets, or in other words, with the C0, all right? So here I use just uh, one subscript A, that's just the indicator function of the set A, okay, and um, square bracket N less than omega, where well, that's a collection of finite subsets of natural numbers, okay? Well, this is obviously a closed uh, subspace of an infinity, but it's more, you can check that it's a uh, self-adjoint subalgebra, of an infinity, in other words, um, well, let's suppose we have complex scalars, right? If you take a, a complex conjugate of an element in it, and you stay within that set, and also subalgebra on the pointwise multiplication. That's also easy to see because we're just working with indicator functions. And then you can hit it with the uh, commutative um, Gelfand Neumark theorem, which tells you that every uh, commutative C star algebra is asymmetrically isomorphic. Um, to uh, C naught of K for some locally compact uh, Hausdorff space K, and that's my space uh, K subscript A. And of course, people who are in this uh, line of work, they will uh, think of a KA. I mean, there are many ways you can describe it. I mean, it's a maximal ideal space of your commutative C star algebra, or the uh, sometimes referred to as the spectrum of the uh, C star algebra. But uh, boss, I mean, it's just this sort of gives us that it, uh, it exists, all right? And the origins here, well, in Barnard space theory, I believe uh, Barnard spaces of, of this form here uh, were first uh, studied by um, uh, Bill Johnson and uh, Jon Lindenstrauss in the paper on Israel, General of Mathematics in 1974. Uh, but as I already said, I mean, the actual, the local compact, locally compact household space is much older. It goes back to the 1920s and Alexandrov and Urison. And for that reason, people often refer to it as an AU compactum or, well, as I shall do, a Mrovka space. So that's, I mean, I started looking at these things with George Kosmida, and he calls them Mrovka spaces. So I adopted that uh, terminology. Uh, some people call them Isbel Mrovka spaces, and some people are call them Psi spaces. And if you call them a Psi space, then usually instead of calling uh, the actual locally compact household space case of A, you might write it as Psi subscript A. So there are some differences in notation here, but um, this is uh, sort of uh, how I will uh, refer to them. Okay. And I think that gives me taking it to the first uh, little break here. I decided this is a long talk, so I should give you some opportunities to um, catch your breath and ask some questions. So any questions so far? No, as I say, yes. <clears throat> so can we say that this K of A space is a quotient space of its own check of the application of natural numbers? That's right. Everything is yes, everything is right. Mm -hmm. um, just by yes. By the property of this from checking. Everything was just. Everything was. Uh, 
Be because yes, because it's the biggest uh, compactification on our right. Oh, thanks. Sorry. Okay, sure. Okay. Sure. Good. Okay. Uh, other questions? Okay, well, if not, um, let's uh, move on. And I'm going to uh, tell you now, I mean, this uh, relates to your question that uh, there are, I mean, there are several other ways you can define the, uh, this uh, Morocco space associated with an um, almost disjoint uh, family. Uh, so, uh, well, later on, I'll give you kind of a hands-on definition that I quite uh, like. I mean, where you can sort of see what the points are. Uh, which is convenient when you're trying to work with it. So, so I'll come to that, uh, not some dogs definition of it later today, uh, but also, well, if, I mean, on the other uh, side, if you prefer abstract methods, you can also uh, approach it from a very abstract perspective and probably much closer to the uh, Czech stone compactification. Namely, you can simply view uh, Ka as the stone space associated with the booleans of algebra of the power set of the natural numbers uh, that is generated by your almost disjoint family together with the finite subsets of the natural numbers. Okay, so then you put it into a stone's machine, out of stone duality, that once you have a Boolean subalgebra, you get um, a totally disconnected um, um, space associated with it. And that's how you can also get it out. But the price you pay for do, using shooting at it with this high powered machinery is then you have to work with um, ultra filters rather than with points. And at least I find it's um, easier to kind of visualize the, um, um, the more kind of a concrete description. But there are also, of course, uh, advantages of the more um, abstract approach. So, <clears throat> just a very basic remark here. If you take two distinct uh, subsets of the natural numbers and you look at the um, at infinity distance between their um, indicator functions, it's obviously one, right? There is a point where one of them is one and the other one is zero, okay? So that tells you that um, one almost disjoint family uh, A, uh, the associated space X sub A is separable if and only if the almost disjoint family is countable. And you would say this is uh, bad news for us because of course, um, uh, as we already said, I mean, countable almost disjoint families, well, you can make them uh, totally disjoint. I mean, genuinely disjoint. So that's kind of the trivial case. That's not very interesting for us. So in other words, uh, in all the interesting cases, uh, we are forced to work in the non-separable uh, environment. Um, so let me also uh, say a little bit about uh, terminology here before uh, I trip up. So, I mean, a C of K space, I think most people would agree, is uh, simply a space of continuous functions defined on some compact house of space K. But since most of the results, in fact, I think all the results I discuss uh, here will be on an isomorphic nature, sometimes I'll allow myself to be a bit uh, loose in my terminology, and I will talk about C of K spaces uh, in a sort of isomorphic sense. So in other words, I'll say that a C of K space is just a bound space that's isomorphic to uh, C of K in a sort of a strict sense. And the reason why this is convenient is that then this space here, of course, is C naught of K of A. It's a locally compact uh, space, not a compact space. And therefore you might say, well, is that really a C of K space? Well, it is in this sense because it's um, isomorphically a C of K space. It's, um, I mean, C naught of K of A is isomorphic to um, continuous functions on one point compactification on the K A. So for that reason, I will allow these guys here to be referred to as C of K spaces, okay? So uh, let's see, just to uh, tell you why it's not so surprising perhaps this fact here, I mean, you may think, um, I mean, clearly, well, say if you follow the Texan school of Rosenthal and so on, right, that all balance spaces are separable and they really, or to be a decent balance spaces should have a basis, then you will say, well, uh, how aren't we violating that condition? Isn't, aren't we wasting our time here? Well, if you're looking at your case spaces, I think you very quickly need to go outside the um, uh, class of separable uh, spaces. So let me just review the isomorphic classification of separable uh, COK spaces. This has come up in several uh, previous talks, but uh, well, I prepared these uh, slides uh, a while ago, so um, I decided just to stick with it. Again, from, in the spirit of a mini course, I thought it would do no harm or uh, say less experienced uh, people to see this um, from uh, scratch. So basically, COK is separable precisely when the underlying compact space is metrosable. So suppose we have a compact metric space. Well, then there are basically three cases to consider. If K is finite, well, that's easy, right? 
continuous functions on a finite set, well, that's just uh, the values at the end points. So that's L infinity n. So you just take um, n copies of the scalar field with the uh, maximal on it. In, of course, as a cardinality of your set. On the other, at the other extreme, we have Milutin's theorem that if your uh, compact metric space is uncountable, then uh, there's only one space you get out of it. All right. So then C of K is isomorphic to produce functions on the Cantor cube or on the unit interval or whichever infinite uh, uncountable compact metric space you uh, might favor going by. All right, so that's the other uh, extreme. I haven't put it, by the way, any uh, time or day, year or whatever on Milutin's theorem. I believe he proved it probably in the 1950s or so in his uh, thesis, but it was then unpublished uh, in the thesis for a long time, and I think it only appeared <coughs> like in 1966. But for that reason, it kind of was known for a long time before its uh, official uh, publication date. And so after Milutin had actually proved it, but before it uh, was published, um, Besaga and Prochinsky, in 1960, they handled the intermediate case, that of a countably infinite uh, compact metric space. And then they showed that in that case, uh, you need to look at um, countable ordinal intervals. More precisely, they showed that there is a unique countable ordinal alpha, such that your CFK space is isomorphic to uh, continuous functions on the ordinal interval up to omega to the omega to the alpha. Uh, so this is just now using ordinal interval uh, notation. So this here, this collects, it just denotes the set of all ordinals not exceeding omega to the omega to the alpha. And I put the order topology on that, all right? Incidentally, I should also perhaps explain that for me, this symbol just means isomorphism. It doesn't mean isometric isomorphism in case anyone wonders. I think some people use it um, in that sense. And well, the uh, modern way of finding the Ordinal alpha that appears in that uh, formula there is by the uh, Schlenk index. I think that was also mentioned yesterday. And the reason is that whatever the Schlenk index is, it's an ordinal index. You can hit a, um, an astral uh, space with it. And if you hit your, uh, this particular space with it, well, then that will give you, that will spit out omega to the alpha plus one. So that way you can basically see what alpha is. So this result is due to Samuel from uh, 83, and um, I put modern in quotation marks because uh, some people may think that something that is uh, nearly 40 years old is hardly uh, uh, the latest fashion of the day. But of course, uh, modern here refers to the fact that this is not how um, uh, Pesaka and Kuczynski uh, proved it because the Schlenk index was only introduced by Schlenk in, I think, 68 or something like that. So um, this is a much more recent way of doing it. And in fact, I mean, there's been significant um, um, interest, progress in the study of Schlenk indices in the last, whatever, uh, 10, 15, 20 years. So this is actually quite a modern topic to uh, study Schlenk indices in quantum spaces, but I'll not go into that at all. I just wanted to mention this in case anyone was interested in how you sort of can do your hands-on calculations here. All right, so that was the isomorphic um, classification of the circle of spaces. Um, so a long-standing open problem is to understand the complemented subspaces of CFK spaces. All right, here are a few positive results. There are not a lot of them. c naught's prime. So that again is Prochinsky, uh, 1960. So prime means that every uh, complemented infinite dimensional subspace is isomorphic to the space itself. So there's only one isomorphism type of um, complemented infinite dimensional subspace. All right, well, this result was uh, generalized by Granero to um, arbitrary uh, cardinalities. So if you have gamma as your index set now, uh, possibly uncountably, uncountable, right? Then if you have any uh, complemented uh, subspace of C0 of gamma, well, it must be isomorphically C0 uh, of delta for some uh, subset delta of gamma, or in other words, I mean, uh, just a delta, a, um, a set of cardinality, this and then equal to the cardinality of gamma. And well, uh, that was a generalization of um, Wojcicki's result in a different direction, uh, generalizing it. So remember from the isomorphic uh, classification on the previous page, the first, um, I mean, the next uh, example, so C0 kind of is the simplest um, example of a CLK space in the countably infinite case. The next one up is when you take alpha equal to one here. So that's a continuous function from zero up to omega to the omega. If you have uh, your ordinates are smaller than that, then you just get isomorphically C0 out, all right? But uh, C of uh, C0 to omega to the omega is not isomorphic to C0. It's so the first one, okay. And in that case, Benjamini uh, showed that there are now two 
isomorphism types of uh, complemented infinite dimensional subspaces, namely uh, C0 or the whole space. All right. And finally, also we know that the infinity is prime. So again, all its infinite dimensional complemented subspaces are just an infinity again. So that's Linton's graphs from the uh, 60s. And as far as I'm aware, that's a complete list of uh, known results here. But the longstanding uh, conjecture is that every complemented subspace of a CLK space uh, is isomorphic to a CLK space itself. Obviously, here yeah, when I say C of K first, it's not the same K, right? But um, I mean another for another uh, compact space. But recently, quite an exciting result that was uh, disproved by Dracos uh, Cabanet and uh, Alberto Sergero, um, um, <clears throat> who I think is here somewhere, right? I, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, so he's going to uh, talk to us uh, tomorrow. So, um, um, and I hope we will hear more about this result, but I wanted to uh, flag it up here, first of all, because uh, this is an important part of my motivation for picking this topic here. I realized that there are many um, applications of these um, rough cast spaces these days in Barnock space theory. They really have quite um, exciting applications. All right, so this uh, preprint that I think appeared on the archive in November last year, if I'm not mistaken, well, it says there is an uncountable almost disjoint family A with the property that C naught of um, the uh, Rovka space associated with A contains a complemented subspace, which is not isomorphic to uh, C or K for any uh, compact uh, space K. So uh, the conjecture uh, was disproved using such uh, spaces. Okay, and well, I should say, however, that uh, the conjecture is still open for in a separable case. If anyone plans as a challenge, I think that's a really, really hard problem. But uh, flip side, if you solve it for your PhD, say you will probably have a pretty good uh, thesis. So, I think you can you can add an infinity C to the list. Ah, an infinity quotient C. Yes, I think you're right. No, an infinity. The count can be supported as functions. Oh, that one. Oh, I see. Is that your result with uh, Johnson, Schechtman, and um... Oh, I see. Okay, well, okay. Yes, okay. I should update that one with a fifth point. So, um, what I'm saying, let me just write it down because, um, so this is a space that is usually called, um, what do you say, L, L infinity C, yeah. right? Of, um, for any gamma. Yeah. Okay, so you take any countable, um, sorry, you take any uncountable uh, set uh, gamma, and then you look at the subspace of L infinity gamma consisting of those uh, functions that have countable support. And then again, you can get, and I guess you get a sort of the analog of the uh, Granero's result, right? That everything will be of a similar form for uh, something of possibly smaller analysis, right? Okay, thank you, uh, Tomek. Okay, so uh, also in that uh, preprint, um, Gregorich and uh, Alberto uh, show that uh, you can also uh, use uh, this construction to get an uh, exotic uh, example of an extension of balance spaces. So more precisely, you can find an uncountable almost disjoint family A with the property that if you take, well, C0 of K of A contains a subspace isomorphic to C0, but when you take the quotient modulo of that subspace, the quotient space you get out is not isomorphically a CLK space. And that um, relates to um, a substantial uh, bit of uh, literature on, um, um, on extensions of Banach spaces and in particular uh, CK spaces. So I know uh, Jesus Castillo is um, here. He is probably the leading expert on this kind of uh, material. So slightly uh, intimidating to uh, move into uh, unfamiliar uh, territory here, but I thought I should flag it up because I mean, again, these, uh, there are lots of uh, important <coughs> applications there of uh, almost uh, disjoint families. So one result which um, Jesus proved together with um, Cabello Sanchez and uh, Martyshevsky and uh, also uh, then Kabanek and um, uh, Sergero, right, uh, is, so they, and now we see, I think the first time here we see uh, um, extra axioms outside of ZFC appearing, so we need here Martin's, Martin's axiom and the negation of the continuum hypothesis. Uh, the latter will be obvious when I tell you the statement, right, that because we want to take two uncountable almost disjoint families, and they have to have card analysis strictly less than the continuum. So obviously this cannot happen unless you assume the negation of the continuum hypothesis, right? Well, in that case, actually, there's only one, um, there's only one isomorphism type of this uh, space here. So in other words, C0 of K subscript A is isomorphic to C0 uh, subscript um, 
B, all right? And also um, this space here is isomorphic to its um, Cartesian square. So this is a question that uh, Kushmida had uh, raised previously. And well, um, on the other hand, once you move up to um, the um, cardinality of the continuum, well, then you don't need any extra actions. But in that case, there are two to the continuum many non-isomorphic uh, Banach spaces of uh, this form C0 of K of A associated with an almost uh, disjoint family of cardinality C, all right? So this is sort of very, very extreme that uh, you have only one uh, in here, and then suddenly you have this uh, maximum number you can imagine of uh, non-isomorphic examples there. And of course, in this case here, the result doesn't require any uh, actions as the theorem of set of C. And um, I believe that work actually uh, built on work that uh, Matyshevsky had already done previously with um, Paul. Okay. So, um, well, let, maybe just to give a very, very brief background on why, um, uh, why these kind of, um, uh, <coughs> these kind of questions around extensions came up. So that again is some work by uh, Cabello Sanchez and Jesus Castillo, together with uh, Nigel Colton and David uh, Jost from uh, 2003. So they were looking at the extensions of the form. So you take, you have your space here in the middle, you embed C of K space into it, and then you look at the quotient KX here, and you initially they were looking at separable quotients and your uh, compact space was either the unit interval or um, the ordinal interval up to omega to the omega. And um, well, but in that study, they also uh, raised a, a question that turned out to be rather uh, intriguing and uh, important. It was non-separable and uh, it was motivated by a subject theorem. So the question they asked was that now if you move beyond um, metrosable uh, compact Hausdorff spaces, so in other words, if you pick a non-metrosable compact Hausdorff space K, is it possible that whenever you take C naught, you embed it into um, X in such a way that the quotient is C of K, well, then that extension must split in the category of Banach spaces. In other words, just meaning that X here is a direct sum of the quotient and the uh, image of the C naught, all right? And their belief was that uh, the answer should be no. So that's the CCKY conjecture. CCKY stands for uh, Cabello Castillo, Cotton and Jost, I believe, okay? And well, that was then around for a while and motivated some very good research and they just give you the uh, resolution here because again, an almost disjoint family uh, pops up here because uh, Marzyshevsky <coughs> and Kribanek, uh, again, assuming Martin's action and the negation of the continuum hypothesis, well, they showed that if you take an uncountable almost disjoint family of cardinalysis with the less than the continuum, then every extension of this form here splits in the category of Banach spaces, all right? So in other words, there's no interesting way of putting um, C0 and C0 KA into a Banach space X. If you wanted, you have to make a direct sum of them, all right? Um, <clears throat> so that basically showed that at least consistency, consistently, you could find a negative solution to the um, CCKY conjecture. But um, later on, uh, joined by Antonio Aviles, um, Matyshevsky and Klebanek then uh, uh, showed that if you go to the other uh, side of the equation and you now assume the continuum hypothesis, uh, so that of course that rules out any example of that form. And as soon as you roll those examples out, well then actually um, for every non metrosable compact Hausdorff space, K, okay, there is an extension of this particular form which doesn't split. So in this case, if you assume the continuum hypothesis, then the CCKY conjecture is true, All right? So that was uh, all I wanted to uh, say about this. Um, I should admit I'm not a specialist in this area, but I thought these are quite uh, important results to also motivate why we as uh, Barnard Space or Barnard Glasses theorists should be interested in um, these uh, compact household uh, spaces associated with almost disjoint families. Okay, so um, another break, uh, questions? Yes? Uh, sorry, could you show again the slide with the CCKY conjecture, with the conjecture? Definitely, that is. Okay, thank you. Sure. Other questions? Okay. Right, so, 
since I have admitted what is not uh, my uh, expertise, maybe I should say what I do know a little bit about. So um, as I already indicated, I mean, I'm really more from an operator uh, theory uh, side of the uh, world. And so the question I want to uh, motivate what I'm going to focus on mostly here is what operators must exist on an infinite dimensional Banach space. Okay, so back to the beginnings. So X now is just a general Banach space, could be either real or complex. <coughs> And uh, script B of X is uh, the collection of bounded linear operators on X. And I will always just assume operators are bounded and linear. Uh, and the question is, how small can B of X be? Well, we always have the identity operator, of course. Uh, well, by Han Banach, uh, we also have lots of finite rank operators. So in other words, the ideal of um, bounded operators with finite dimensional ranges is um, <coughs> large. But uh, it's never closed when P, when X is infinite dimensional because it's relatively easy uh, to show that this ideal uh, is closed if and only if it's everything, uh, which of course is the same as saying that X is finite dimensional. And of course, when X is finite dimensional, then P of X, uh, well, that's just the n by n matrices, and that's their simple algebra. That's well known. And if you want to generalize that fact uh, to arbitrary uh, dimensions, then you can simply show that every non-zero ideal of P of X. Uh, X finite or infinite dimensional must contain the uh, ideal of um, finite rank operators. And then, of course, you immediately get the simplicity here because the two are equal in finite dimensions, right? Okay, so, well, now the question is so basically, we have concluded that we have the identity operator, we have this ideal of finite rank operators, it's not closed as soon as you are in infinite dimensions. So the question is, would there always be something else, right? Is, a, is it, in other words, possible to find an infinite dimensional Banach space so that every operator on it is a scalar multiple of the identity plus something in the closure of the finite rank operators? And I guess most people will know that the answer to that question is yes, due to a formidable uh, construction by Judas and Hayden from about uh, 11 years ago now in ACTA. So they showed that there is a Banach space uh, known as the Adjuris Hayden space, which has in the jargon very few operators, meaning that it satisfies that every operator is a scalar multiple of the identity, plus a compact operator. But because the space has a charter basis, being a compact operator is the same as being in the closure of the finite ranks. And in fact, I mean, even though this is obviously a very, very exotic Banach space, well, it's dual, there's a very familiar Banach space, it's just a little L1. So that's kind of the, uh, if you like, that's a combination of the theory of the uh, product spaces with a uh, few operators. And you could say, well, why don't we uh, uh, pack up and go home here? That's it. But of course, you can then try and specialize to other uh, cases and so on. So, um, well, let me just mention the history, a bit of history behind the uh, Jules Hayden uh, space. So, uh, I mean, this is a combination of a long sequence of constructions of what I call uh, exotic Banach spaces or perhaps purpose-built Banach spaces. So it goes back, I think, to Silson's construction in 1972. He constructed a Banach space that doesn't contain C0 or little lp for any uh, p in the separable uh, range, okay? But other key ingredients uh, in the work of Adjelos and Hayden was the so-called bourquin de Pain, uh, construction, which was a completely new way of uh, producing uh, pre duals of little l1. Um, also, uh, the so-called Strumprecht space. So in the late uh, 1980s, I think uh, Thomas Strumprecht uh, produced a modification of the uh, Silson's uh, construction that gave an arbitrarily distortable Banach space. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but basically once Strumprecht had done that, then Gauss and Moret um, picked up from there and did a further modification of it. And they uh, obtained what's called a hereditarily decomposable Banach space. So what's hereditarily decomposable, well, it means that if you take any of its infinite dimensional subspaces, it's indecomposable in the sense that you cannot write it as a direct sum of two infinite dimensional subspaces, right? So in other words, not only is the space, the only complemented subspaces of the space have a finite co-dimension or a finite dimensional, uh, but also that applies to every uh, closed subspace of it, right? And well, the relevance of, um, this space uh, to few operator agenda is that uh, Gauss and Moret, at least in the complex uh, case, they showed that every operator on an HR space here must be a scalar multiple of the identity plus a strictly singular operator. And uh, again, I apologize, uh, Alejandro, I conflict with your uh, notation here. So for me, the script S of X is the ideal of the strictly singular operators. Uh, so um, uh, just to remind you, an operator is strictly singular. 
if whenever you restrict it to an infinite dimensional subspace, what you get is not isomorphic embedding, or in other words, it's not bounded below. So every time you have a positive epsilon and an infinite dimensional subspace of X, you can find a unit vector in that infinite dimensional subspace, such that uh, the norm of the image on the S of it is less than epsilon. All right, so that's, so the strictly single operators, I mean, for many um, purposes, uh, they can play a similar role of um, compact operators. They have kind of a small ideal in particular in the realm of fragment theory and so on. Okay, um, I think the situation here of uh, the few operators statement is slightly more complicated. If you go to real scalars, you can get uh, things like the quaternions or the complex or something, but um, so let's just stick to that one there for, the, uh, for now. Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, so perhaps I mean, so so this was the background of the Agilis Hayden, and as I say, that's the most spectacular uh, result. But to kind of bring this back into the CLK uh, space context, uh, let's just try and uh, focus on particular classes of bound spaces. All right, and the earliest example I know of a bound space that can be claimed to have a uh, few operators is due to Schiller, and again, Schiller needed a um, an additional axiom, the sort of uh, so-called the diamond axiom. And what Schiller proved in 78 is there's a non separable bottom space such that every operator on it is a scalar multiple of the identity plus an operator with separable range. All right. And you can now see. So here, script X here stands for the uh, closed operator ideal of operators uh, that have separable uh, range. OK. And you can again see how this is sort of exotic. And it shows, in some sense, few operators, right? You would expect on a non separable space there should be lots of operators with non separable range. But not necessarily so. Okay, um, well, further uh, results along those lines. Well, 10 years later, uh, Stefans uh, joined Schiller and uh, they managed to get rid of the diamond axiom. So they got an example within ZFC. Uh, then for his PhD, he Walk constructed a reflexive example. And then much more recently, um, he came up with a uniformly uh, convex example. Um, although I think he said he actually knew how to do that for a while before it came out print okay and so the connection with our topic here is i want to look at what it means for a clk space to have a few operators all right so um <coughs> well um, this is where i again want to remind you that when i say ck space i am satisfied to be isomorphic to a ck space because this is of an isomorphic uh, nature what i say here all right so well, first, to, to do that, we need to look at the background, the literature, to actually decide what should it really mean for a CFK space to have few operators. I mean, an ambitious uh, person right, would say, well, why don't we try and do an agilis Hayden construction and get scalar multiple of the identity plus uh, compact, right? Well, I'll tell you in a minute why that's impossible. So Pochinski, again, um, in the 60s, he proved that the following three things are equivalent for an operator from a CFK space into any kind of Banach space. So being weakly compact, being strictly singular, and not fixing a copy of C0. Uh, what does it mean to fix a copy of C0? Well, um, that just means that you can find a, an isomorphic copy of C0 within your uh, domain space, so that the composition TR is an isomorphic embedding. And of course, I mean, fixing a copy of C0, basically what it says is, if a, an operator defined on a CFK space is not strictly singular, well, it's not just that it fixes some infinite dimensional subspace, it actually is because it fixes a copy of C0 in particular. So that's what Kuczynski uh, showed. And well, in a remark in uh, my paper with the plot, we observed that actually um, uh, you, cannot, um, you cannot expect any analog among CK spaces of the gauss moret uh, K space, and let alone uh, the agilis hayden um, case because the ideal of weak and compact operators must always have um, infinite co-dimension in the BFC of K. In fact, even more is true, this uh, quotient uh, algebra here is always uh, non-separable. I was a bit surprised this didn't seem to be anywhere in the um, literature, so we decided to put it in our uh, paper, but if anyone is aware of it being known, uh, please do let me uh, know. But basically this says that if you're trying to construct something like scalar multiple identity plus weakly compact, it's not gonna happen if you restrict yourself to um, CLK spaces. All right, so let me instead say what you can do in terms of um, uh, CLK spaces that can reasonably claim to have few operators in light of this. And so the first uh, example, I think is due to Piotr Schmieder, uh, that's the, space with um, 
so-called weak multiplications. And the starting point of that <coughs> construction is that whenever you have a C of K space, let's say Banach algebra, you have a pointwise multiplication of functions, right? So in other words, you have an ample supply of multiplication operators. Every time you fix a function F, you can take the pointwise product with F, that will give you a new um, uh, function in C of K. And this is obviously a um, linear operator, okay? So they, they will always be there. And what Kurtz did in 2004, Assuming the continuum hypothesis, but shortly afterward, um, uh, Gregor Pelopanik came along and got rid of it, so he moved the theorem to within the set of C. Uh, so um, the theorem is that you can find an infinite compact house of space K, so that every operator on it is such a multiplication operator plus a weakly compact operator or a fairly single operator, if you prefer that language. All right. So that I think has a reasonable claim of being a um, a few operator space in the sort of spirit of um, Gauss and Morel, right? And let me just uh, point out here a few things about this CFK space. So CFK is a Grothendieck space, meaning that on the, at the level of the dual uh, space, uh, weak and weak <coughs> star sequential convergence are the same thing. So in other words, I mean, if you want to turn apart the, I mean, you know, this is a um, a non-reflexive space, so you know that the weak star and the um, weak topology can't be the same, but in order to distinguish them, you need to move to uh, nets. You can't just get away with sort of undergraduate maths and uh, pretend that nets are see, see their sequences are enough and so on. Um, okay, so, um, well, as a consequence, a Grothendieck space cannot contain a complemented copy of C0, so um, this will, um, I'll link that to my next example here. All right, um, so I just wanted to mention that here. So that's the first example of um, a CK space with few operators. The second uh, example that Piotr produced came out the year after, uh, again, assuming the continuum hypothesis. And in this case, um, what Piotr showed, and this is what relates directly to um, the topic today, is there's an, un an uncountable, almost disjoint family A with the property that the um, every operator on this um, C naught of the Morka space associated with A uh, is a scalar multiple of the identity plus an operator with a separable range. And this is where I also uh, have a little role to play here because uh, Piotr came to Lancaster as a distinguished visitor of the Faculty of Science and Technology. So a tip of the hat to my university for uh, funding his uh, visit. That was back in 2019 when these kind of things were still possible. And uh, we worked on this and we managed to get such an example that uh, works within ZFC, all right? So um, tomorrow, I hope to outline a proof of this result. So this is the sort of, a, this, is, this is my personal connection with almost disjoint families. And so this is, I hope to uh, start tomorrow when we hopefully all uh, fresh and full of energy, uh, just kind of uh, give you an idea of um, how that proof works, okay? And I want to here. I just want to give you some consequences and um, um, <clears throat> of it of the theorem. Um, but let me just uh, give a few remarks. So this is an exact analog of Schirach space among CFK spaces. Remember, Schirach had scalar multiple identity plus uh, separable range. That's exactly what we have here. So uh, at least it is an analog of some uh, kind of um, uh, pure operator space of a general type, right? So. Uh, some general uh, remarks here that whenever you have an almost disjoint family, then um, C naught of the associated Mocker space contains a complemented <coughs> copy of C naught. I'll tell you a bit more about that uh, shortly, but this tells you that it can, cannot be a Grothendieck space. So that is why I told you about Grothendieck spaces before. All right. Also, I think I promised you before that I would justify that uh, C naught of the Mocker space is as morphically as CFK space because the reason is it's isomorphic to uh, the continuous functions on this one point compactification. Okay, so therefore when I call it, I say, this is a C of K space with few operators. Well, strictly speaking, this is a C of K space with few operators, but yeah, uh, we just uh, move down and forth because they are isomorphic, so it doesn't matter. So let me just show you why that is. Well, I just said that uh, uh, the um, C naught of a KA contains a complemented subspace of C naught to write it as X plus that copy. Uh, then, well, we say that, of course, the continuous functions that vanish at infinity, right, they have, they are hyperplane within the one point compactification, because these are just all the functions that vanish at the extra point in infinity we have um, added, all right, so this is standard, 
Well, then we use the fact that we've written C0 Ka as X plus C0, and now we use C0 as a multitude hyperplanes. So that will absorb the uh, extra copy of the um, K there, and then we get back to uh, what we wanted. So the two are indeed isomorphic. Okay, so as I say, the, the, the main significance of this is the C0 Ka is really an, a CK space. So if you really, if you want to work asymmetrically, you just have to replace C0 Ka with C of alpha Ka uh, every time. All right, so um, let's see. Well, an observation that I think goes back to the early days of the topic of Johnson and Linus Strauss, they observed, and this is not hard, that whenever you have a separable subspace of C0 of Ka, then it's contained in a subspace that is isomorphic to C0. So in other words, the operators with separable range, well, that's equal to uh, the set of operators that factor through C0, right? One way is easy, right? Because if you have an operator on uh, C0 of Ka, well, you know that its range is contained in a subspace isomorphic to C0. So you just view the operator as an operator to C0, and then you kind of embed that back in, all right? Uh, so on the other hand, of course, if you do factor through C0, uh, then you must have separable range, right? Because uh, C0 is separable. And this is the ideal that I will, this will come up in various contexts. So I often write that as script G, subscript C0, and then a view of on space, okay? So this is the known operator ID. <coughs> okay. So questions, yes? So how common is it for C0 of uh, locally compact space to be uh, isomorphic to C of some K and one point compactification of this group? Well, I mean, whenever you have, um, um, whenever you have um, a complementary copy of C0, it has to happen, right? Yeah. But, um, but for the Grodin expenses, you don't have complemented copies of C0. Basically, that is a separator, I believe, right? If you are, um, if you are, uh, I mean, I believe the following is true, that C of K is not a Grodin space precisely if it contains a complemented copy of C0. Okay? So, for example, I mean, L infinity is the standard example of a non, of, of something, of course, that doesn't contain complemented C0 and it's a Grodin space, but that basically carries over. Okay? Other questions? Right, well, let's get on with it now. So I will now go back to the beginnings and talk a bit more about uh, the basics of these Rothkamp spaces. So we have an almost disjoint family A. Well, then I promised you a knots and bolts definition of Ka rather than going by a uh, Delphi and Nymark. So here it is. Basically, um, what I call the standard representation of the Ka um, is sort of, as I say, a set uh, of points, points. Okay, so there are two types of points in Ka. So one are just points Xn indexed by the um, natural numbers. So they correspond to the uh, finite, uh, I mean, the single sum sets in L infinity. And then uh, the other points I write as Y subscript A. So they are indexed by the almost disjoint family. And of course, the key thing is how these things connect together. So if the XNs, they are isolated. So they are sort of the uh, standard embedded copy of C0 you have in your space, okay? And the idea, I mean, the key idea in this picture is that if you look at the sequence XN, but not for all N in the natural numbers, but just N running through your um, set A coming from the almost disjoint family, then that sequence will converge to the point Y subscript A. That's a key thing you want to know about these uh, beasts, okay? That you somehow, so the idea is somehow, you have this copy of the natural numbers that I call Xn here, and it has lots of different uh, subsequences, of course, and once you do convergence um, of, uh, once, you, once you sort of restrict to a subsequence indexed by one of the sets A from the almost disjoint family, then that will converge, and it will <coughs> converge to this extra point Y subscript A that we've added um, out extra, okay? So that's a, that's a picture you want to have in your head of what these beasts look like. And if you want to describe it more formally, well, you can uh, say what's the neighborhood. I mean, well, since XN is isolated, we don't need to say more about the uh, uh, neighborhoods there, right? But for uh, Y, a, we want to tell you what the neighborhoods look like. Well, the neighborhood basis is basically you take all the XNs in a cofinite subset 
of uh, the set A, all right, together with a limit point YA. So that's a neighborhood basis um, at that point, right? So, um, well, you can check that KA is compact precisely if both A and the, um, if you take the union of the finitely many sets in here and you take the uh, complement of it, if both of those sets are finite, so essentially never, or I mean only in very uninteresting cases, all right? Uh, and also, um, well, this set here is precisely as a set of isolated points. I said they are isolated and there are no others, uh, but it's dense in KA, so <coughs> KA is separable. Don't confuse this with C of KA being separable, right? I'm saying that the topological space KA is separable, so it contains a dense countable uh, set, all right? And, uh, well, um, we know that, um, well, KA is metrizable, in general, that's equivalent to saying that your topological space is second countable, and that's the same as saying that uh, the almost disjoint family A is countable. So again, we get back to, as I said before, I mean, countable almost disjoint families are not terribly interesting, all right? Um, and in any case, of course, in, in that case, I mean, when we are in the metrizable case, we have a full classification of CRK spaces, so we might as well work with that, all right? So, uh, if you look at the complement of this set of the discrete, um, of the, sorry, the, um, the isolated points, well, then you get the YAs, well, that's a closed subspace, and it's a discrete subspace as well. Okay, and, well, the important consequence of this is that KA is a so-called scattered uh, space, so that means that whenever you have a non-empty subset of it, it contains a relatively isolated point, and I want to uh, emphasize that because this is actually, this has a lot of important consequences. Scattered spaces are kind of nice in many ways and have been studied a lot in the literature. So the reason is very simple. So let me just try and see if I can convince you why it's um, scattered. Well, um, if L, your given set, contains one of the XNs, well, the XNs are isolated points, full stop, right? So then we're done. Then L contains an isolated point, not just relatively isolated point. So now suppose that L, um, contains one of the YAs and it's not isolated in L, well, how can that come about? Well, that's because uh, there must be um, infinitely many of these XNs in L, right? Because if it's not isolated, there must be something that converges to YA. What converges to YA? Well, basically this sequence up here, right? So um, in that case, again, if YA is not isolated in L, then it must be because uh, L contains some of the XNs. In fact, for infinitely many Ns in A, and therefore, we can then refer back to uh, one that then, um, uh, again, it contains a, an isolated point. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's it. Okay, it's easy to see this is a scattered space. But as I say, the significance here is that uh, we know lots of things about uh, C of K when K is scattered. So first of all, so you know, K A is an aspirin space. Aspirin spaces have loads and loads of equivalent definitions. The one I personally find easier to remember is that every separable subspace of an aspirin space a separable dual, all right? So we know that, and I believe that's probably even equivalent to being the underlying space being scattered. We also have a Rudin's theorem, which I think probably also characterizes um, the um, uh, being scattered. So the Rudin's theorem says that the um, dual of the C of K is um, little l1 on the corresponding uh, set. So remember, the dual of the C of K in general consists of measures, and what it says here is just that all the measures <laughs> are the point masses. That's the sort of um, that's the significance of that statement there. So in other words, when you work with scattered spaces uh, and you look at the dual, you don't really need to know any uh, measure theory because you're just working with uh, point masses, right? But this will have an important consequence for me that I want to uh, use tomorrow. Because if I take an operator on C0 K of A, I take a function in C0 K of A, and then I take a point in K of A, then of course I can uh, take, apply the operator T to the function. That gives me a new function so I can evaluate it at S. And let me just see, well, I can write that as, of course, a point evaluation delta S applied to uh, T of F, all right? Then I can shift my operator T over by duality. And then I use the fact that uh, this guy here is just an element of little l1. So what is a little l1 duality? Well, you just sum up over all the um, uh, values. So this one here right, is a sum of uh, point masses, right? So how do you do that? Well, this is the uh, outcome, right? We just work out what is the value here on the point mass and compare that out with the function value at that point mass, all right? 
So, um, the, and I mean, the way we think of this is a kind of matrix representation, right? Because if you think of your function f as a column vector, and then here we're sort of summing across a row of this uh, matrix here. So that's the picture you want to um, have in mind for this, right? That this object here, so t star applied to the point mass at s, and then the value of that um, measure at the singleton set t, where you want to think of that as a matrix representation of t. But of course, the uh, price we pay is this is a rather large matrix because it's in, indexed by this um, very large um, uncountable uh, set case of A. All right. Then another theorem that I uh, want to mention is what I call the LPP theorem after uh, Lotz, Peck, and Porter. From 1979. So, uh, ratio that C0 of K of A is saturated with uh, complemented copies of C0. Okay. Uh, again, I mean, it's not specific to C0 of K of A. This happens because it's a scattered, uh, because K is scattered. Okay. So, <clears throat> not only do we have uh, some complemented copies of C0, we actually have them everywhere. So, whenever you take a closed infinite dimensional subspace of C0 of K of A, you can find a sub further subspace of it that is isomorphic to uh, C0. <laughs> and complemented in the whole space. Okay, so we'll use that a little bit later. Okay, so let's see. Um, let me just explain about these complemented and uncomplemented copies of um, C0. Well, if A is countable, as I say, then uh, C0 of K is separable, and then subject tells us all copies of C0 complemented. In fact, I think in this case, it's not that hard to see that C0 of the K must actually be isomorphic with C0 itself. So, um, so that's uh, that. Let's forget about that. A is, has to be uncountable to be interesting, okay? Well, you have the canonical copy of C0 in here. So that's the one spanned by the, um, <coughs> the indicator functions at the uh, isolated points that I call the same. Okay, that's never going to be complemented. And in fact, with um, my former student, Ben Zohovard, we did a uh, generalization of that fact, sort of related to um, results about L infinity. So we showed that if you have an operator on C0 K of A, which kills this canonical uh, copy of uh, C0, well, then actually it must kill an awful more less, uh, an awful more um, else, because you can then find a subset of your almost disjoint family uh, say a prime of the uh, same cardinality and has uh, the property that your operator t must uh, kill all these uh, functions as well. So this is essentially saying that um, you cannot find operators that has um, this, uh, the closed linear span here, which is what I call the um, canonical copy of C0. Uh, you cannot find operators that have those as the kernel. And this is an analogy to the situation for L infinity. You can't find operators on L infinity that will have exactly C0 as the kernel. This is a generalization of um, the fact that C0 is not uh, complemented in L infinity. Anyway, that was a bit of um, digression. Um, it's easy, I claim, to construct a complemented copy of C0 in there. So let me just try and show you that, just to give you an idea of how you work with these, how you can work with these uh, objects. So take a uh, set A in the almost disjoint family then, uh, well, these um, indicator functions at these uh, isolated point masses, well, because they're isolated, they are continuous, right? So, uh, and they're clearly uh, disjoint. So uh, that would give me an isometric uh, embedding of C0 into my uh, space, all right? And then on the other hand, so to go back again, I now want to go back onto C0. How do I do that? Well, I have a function f uh, in C0 ka. I can evaluate it at x a n, and then I can uh, subtract the value at ya, which is sort of the limit point, all right? Well, this will give me an element of C0, exactly because the xans, by the basic property, they converge to ya as n tends to infinity, and uh, therefore uh, my operator v maps uh, the whole space into C0, and it's easy to see it's linear and bound with norm 2, and then I just do a little calculation to see what happens when I compose v with u, well, if you apply u to the uh, standard basis vector of C0, say ek, what do you do? Well, u of ek, now I have to put k instead of a not there. So I take the function, the indicator function of x a k, all right? And I put that here twice, corresponding to those. Then I have to evaluate them at x a n, and I have to subtract the value at y a, and n is now my index. Well, this of course is easy to do, right? This one is one precisely when k and n are equal. 
this one is always zero because ya is never equal to um, xak, right? And so in other words, I got my uh, basis vector back, all right? So the composition vu is uh, equal to uh, the identity operator on C naught. And um, that tells me that basically if I do the composition the other way around, so uv, that will give me a projection onto a copy of C naught within the space, all right? So that's an example of how to find a complementary copy. But as I say, this um, uh, LPP theorem tells you vastly more is true because whenever you take a closed infinite dimensional subspace, you can find copies of C naught inside. Okay. Maybe that's a good point for a breather and uh, questions. Yes. So so can you can you show again the example of the uncomplemented copy of C0? Yes, um, that's the that's the canon the one I call the canonical copy. So that's the span of the um, one x ends. So the major difference between the complemented and the uncomplemented copy is that, that you subtract the limit. Yes. Uh -huh. So so this can actually make the difference. No, well, I mean the point is that in in the in the complemented one, in order to get this one, I also restrict only to the XA ends. So I'm only looking at the points in one of my almost disjoint uh, sets, right? Oh, okay. So I'm throwing away a huge amount of stuff there. Oh, okay. That I think is a key thing that I, um, that I need to do. Um, but I suspect a specialist in this area might have many other ways of doing this. This is just something I came up with when I was preparing and I thought it would be nice to actually show a hands on example of why you have a complemented copy of the Sino in here. I claim there are lots of them, but surely it must be possible to see one, right? Um, okay, other questions? Yes. yes. So if you go back to this, we'll start with uh, Yes. So is this related to, uh, maybe you mentioned this and I miss it. So it, it, there's a result of Rosetan that if you have an operator on n infinity which maps the unit vector basis to something which is some normalized, not, not going to zero, then you preserve a copy of n infinity itself, right? So is this uh, something similar going on in these uh, sort of spaces? I mean, well, I can tell you, I mean, the origin of this is that uh, with another uh, former PhD student of mine, um, um, Jared White, he asked me about, he asked me, I mean, the history of this uh, question is that he asked me if I could give him a reflexive bound of space and an operator or a subspace, a closed subspace of it, that I couldn't realize as the kernel of any operator of the space to itself. So the problem of, uh, the, yeah, let me just try and write this down. Okay, it was, so you want, you have your uh, space, X, you want an operator from X to itself, and you have a subspace in here, and the question is whether you can always find a T from X to itself with a, a property that Y is the kernel of T, all right? And I thought, well, surely this was done in like the 1930s when Barnack had a uh, drink with his mates in the uh, <laughs> Scottish cafe or whatever, right? Um, and to my surprise, it didn't seem to be uh, known. It's relatively easy to see that if X is separable, then you can always do it. Um, but uh, it turned out, that, and this is actually using uh, this um, few operator space of you walk, the reflexive case there, there we could show that it does contain a uh, closed subspace that we cannot realize as the kernel of an operator. So that's the start, but Jared, for other purposes of his studies, he needed a reflexive example. But then this sort of became a, a topic in his own right that uh, when can or can't you do it? And so the question we asked here was for C0 you know, K of A, uh, can we realize uh, subspaces as kernels or not? So it's known for L infinity that you cannot do it. So that's the relevance of it. And I think that relates to the question you asked, namely that C0 cannot be realized as a kernel of an operator on infinity. But uh, you can, um, I mean, in, the, in this space here has essentially the same property. So that's, that's how it kind of works, but it's closer related really to the uh, proof uh, for L infinity. And that's how the almost disjoint family is coming to it. That somehow if you kill certain things, then you must kill a lot more. But, uh, so in connection to that, if you know that you have an operator where for this uh, characteristic functions of the points, this is not going to zero for instance, can you say something that the operator must preserve a large? Uh... Ooh, we didn't. We didn't think of it in uh, that way. Um, that's a, that's a good question, actually. That's an interesting question. Um, 
we, we didn't uh, say we, we didn't uh, think of it uh, that way we should uh, we should probably see if there is something uh, related to to that there okay thank you other other questions okay let's see where we got to okay so now I want to give you some consequences of our uh, main theorem in the main, main last 15 minutes or so. So remember, this was the uh, main theorem about a few operators. And <clears throat> whenever I want to uh, refer to this uh, identity here that I call star there of the few operators, I'll just sort of be brief and say that my almost disjoint family A admits few operators. That's a shorthand for that. So the first result uh, we managed to get in the paper was if you have a, I mean, so this is a strictly a topological result, right? If you have a a continuous self map from the locally compact space Ka to self, well, then either it has countable range or it must fix all or countably many points of Ka. So, this is sort of an analog of having a few operators that here we have few continuous uh, self maps. Okay, so that's for the topologists. Um, also, an old result that Piotr did in his, old, in his first paper, in his original paper, but that uh, works whether or not uh, you needed a CH or not. I mean, this one works uh, in C, uh, is that you have no non trivial decompositions of C0 to K of A. Or, in other words, uh, what uh, the result says is that if you decompose uh, C0 to K A as a direct sum of two closed infinite dimensional subspaces, then one of them must be isomorphic to C0 of Ka, and the other one must be isomorphic to uh, C0. Okay, so there are simply, there's only one way you can do such decomposition, basically. And I was hoping to give you the proof, but I think in light of time, I should probably just uh, skip that um, and go to the next result that I want to mention by uh, the two Tomics, uh, Tomash. Kanya, who is here, and um, his friend uh, Thomas Kanek, uh, so um, 2014, and also I believe uh, Phil Brooker proved it, but he never uh, published it. So basically, this uh, tells you that you can classify all the um, closed ideals uh, when you have um, such an almost dis uh, disjoint and countable family that admits few operators, because in that case, B of C0 Ka contains exactly four ideals. So you have, well, obviously zero and everything, and you also have the compact operators, and you have this ideal of operators with um, separable range, and that's it. So let me just try and see if I uh, have time to outline the proof of this, because this is quite a nice uh, result. So on the first slide here, I will try and do the uh, sort of standard uh, parts, all right? So CK spaces have the approximation property. So the compact operators are the closure of the finite ranks, and that's always the smallest non-zero closed ideal. So this containment here is now uh, accounted for. Second, every compact operator has a um, uh, separable range. So the middle inclusion is okay. And it's a proper inclusion because if you take a projection which has range, say C0, well then that um, clearly has a separable range because C0 is separable. It's not compact because a projection uh, is compact precisely if it has a finite rank. Right, so that uh, tells us that we have a proper inclusion of there. And that was using the example we just saw, all right? Well, finally, um, of, uh, well, the ideal of operators with um, separable range is proper because the identity, I mean, the whole space is non-separable. So the identity is clearly not an operator with a separable range, okay? But of course, by the uh, few operator assumption, uh, this ideal has co-dimension one in here, and therefore it's a maximal ideal, okay? There can't be anything further in between the two, okay? So all that remains to show is that um, this ideal is contained in the ideal generated by any non-compact operator, right? We know this is the smallest non-zero ideal. Suppose we take an operator which is not in there, then if I can show that the idea generates contains that guy there, then I'll be done, right? Because then there's nowhere, no, then there can't be anything else. And this will follow from the fact that the identity on C0 uh, factors through every uh, non-compact operator. Let me just try and convince you why that is, okay? So, Let's suppose I have proved that I have my, um, I just write that down here, I think, C0 Ka, I have my non compact operator there. I have shown that uh, I can factor the identity on C0 through it, like that. Okay, now I want to show that, um, that I can do. Um, 
let's see, I can get uh, <coughs> that that every um, that uh, every operator of a separable range has to be um, contained in the ideal generated by T. So in other words, I need to take a, a general operator up here, say S, which has separable range, and I want to factor that uh, through T. How do I do that? Well, I say I can consider, so let me just write that down here, right? Remember that the range of this is a separable uh, subspace, so it's contained in some subspace, say, called a W, which is isomorphic to uh, C naught. Okay, so in other words, I can look at my operator S, they call it S tilde, as an operator into the space uh, W that I can then put back up here. All right, and then of course, uh, W is isomorphic to C0, or maybe I'll just like this out properly, so we have W, W, and then the inclusion up there. So that's a commutative diagram there. I have an isomorphism here, say, call it U, and then I can take the inverse of that isomorphism to get back, and I get a commutative diagram. So and I've shown that if I can fact, if I take a non-compact operator T, I need to show that I factor the identity on C naught through it. Well, then, in fact, I can factor uh, every operator with separable range through the operator um, T, and therefore, uh, once I'm bigger than that ideal, I must be uh, contained that ideal there. Okay, so that's what remains to do. And this is the proof of the two atomics. So let's try and see how they uh, continued from there. Okay, so that was our aim. The first step is to argue that compact and weakly compact operators are the same. So this uses um, sort of very classical uh, results. So uh, an operator is compact. If its dual is compact by Schauder, uh, then we observe that the dual of C0 by Rudin's theorem was little l1. Little l1 has the sure property. So in other words, uh, norm and weak convergence of sequences are the same thing. So that of course means that compact and weak compactness of operators are the same on the dual level. And then we use Gantmacher to get back to um, the weakly compact operators from the weak compactness of the dual one. All right, and then, so that was what I said up there, I wanted to argue, but then finally, um, by Pochinsky, um, being, <coughs> being um, uh, weakly compact is the same as not fixing a copy of CCLO. Okay, so um, in other words, if I have a non-compact operator, so I take the negation of my calculation there, well, then I can find an operator R from C0 into C0 of Ka with the property that uh, T composed with R is an isomorphic embedding, right? Being non-compact means you must fix a copy of C0, all right? Well, in particular, then the range of that operator when it's isomorphic to C0 is uh, in particular closed and infinite dimensional. Then I fire this uh, lotz porter peck theorem at it to con conclude that uh, every uh, closed infinite dimensional subspace uh, here contains a further subspace Z with the property that is isomorphic to C0 and is complemented in the whole space. And now I pull that back to C0 along my isomorphic embedding here. So I get an isomorphic copy of Z over on C0. And well, then I just uh, say, well, because TR is an isomorphic embedding, then the restriction of TR to W is an isomorphism up to Z. It has an inverse S. And now I need to check some diagram chasing that uh, I done what I promised. So uh, that I think again is best uh, drawn here on the board to try and show you how this works out in practice. Okay, so the idea is we, let's see, we start up here with the identity on C0. Okay, then we say that uh, Z was isomorphic to C0. So we go into Z here. Okay, so this is U, this is the identity, and this is U inverse with that of my notation right there. Yes, all right. Then I have an operator S that maps Z isomorphically onto uh, W, all right? And S is an is the inverse of the restriction of TR viewed as an operator from W onto Z. So I'll just decorate my symbol in a slightly uh, excessive way there. Okay, to just say that if I compose, if I first do S and then I do TR, but I stay onto W, then I get back into Z. All right, so that's what I know. And now I'm nearly there. All right, because now what do I do? Well, I put W back into C naught. 
Then I go over with R, that takes me into C0. Okay, A, then I go, then I apply T, and I project that down onto Z, all right? And if you look at that diagram there, well, this, this uh, bit here also commutes, right? Because what have I done here? Well, I've embedded W into C0, applied R, then T, then gone back down onto Z. Well, that's exactly the same as just doing RT and regarding it as an operator into uh, Z, all right? So that's a commutative diagram as well. And now I have the factorization that I want, right? Because I simply start up here, I go down here, that's my first operator that goes from C0 into C0 KA, and then to get back, I do that one there, all right? And this is, I think, what's written out, but in slightly uh, harder to interpret uh, or unpack notation there at the bottom, all right? And, okay, I think that takes me to any questions uh, break, and um, maybe this is a good point to uh, stop for today, but uh, if you have any questions, of course, I'm very happy to uh, try and answer them.